Okay, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me. Here's the dates. And quite well, a privilege to be here at the UT Austin. Actually, I, I landed yesterday feeling an alien, but I just learned that there is a Palestine here in Texas, so <laughs> <laughs> I feel more. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, actually, the original topic of this talk was Yemi Habibi and uh, this optimist. But then I realized you can't understand Yemi Habibi without going back to the military government uh, period. So I ended up writing about the whole presentation about the military government period background. But I will try to be brief and move to Yemi Habibi, which is my favorite topic. Uh, I'll try to take you back in time to that military government period, uh, and um, it is a little known period, even though it represents a quarter of Israel's existence, but few people know about it. Um, it lasted for two decades. Almost. Now, like all things Palestinians, uh, it started with the Nakba. During which, you know the story about uh, 750,000 Palestinians were expelled from their homes and became lifetime refugees. Meanwhile, uh, 150,000 managed somehow to survive and remain within the borders with the no uh, Jewish state. Now, nowhere was the Palestinian situation more absurd uh, than <clears throat> in the case of those Palestinians who managed to remain uh, within the borders of Israel. Overnight, these Palestinians became strangers in their homeland, and the targeted minority. Um, the early Zionist establishment feared that these Palestinians might become a Trojan horse for Arab and Palestinian nationalists outside Israel. So they were perceived as the enemies from within, um, a demographic time bomb, a fifth column population. So the first question that, the main question that hunted the early Zionist establishment was what to do with those Palestinians who managed to stay within uh, Israel. And the answer was in the form of military governance. It was in the worst. There was an ethnic cleansing that year and transfer plans. So military governance, it was, <clears throat> uh, which lasted, of course, for, as I said, for two decades, from 1948 to uh, 1966, do which is an imposed a formal military administration of its Palestinian minority. And the military government policies included uh, or involved ethnic segregation, economic segregation, restrictions of movement, and political, cultural, and intellectual activities. Um, so for nearly two decades, Palestinians in Israel were cut off from the Arab world, from other Palestinian people and from Egypt. Cap or tram in the iron cage fashioned by the military governments, these Palestinians actually, the third generation of Palestinians in Israel was born in a state of cultural isolation and national uh, alienation. I'll talk about this feeling of alienation later when I was discussing it have you. Uh, so that, but the absurdity of this period was that the, the absurdity of this period resulted in the old formation of an Arab citizenship awareness or consciousness within the oppressive apparatus of the military government. So this coexistence was quite absurd for many Palestinians who came to family how, as citizens, they were subjected to this kind of uh, uh, governance. So Arabs were granted a Israeli citizenship and the right to vote, but they had less and less political and civil rights. Limited freedom, including uh, freedom of movement, expression, and press. Suspended rights, including the right of association, assembly, for example. Um, Arabs were not allowed to become full members in the Israeli um, uh, labor association, the Hesedu. Um, so it was a nominal democracy marked by voter suppression and uh, intimidation. So voter rights were not a free gift to these uh, uh, Arab citizens. During this period, the military government intimidated and coerced Palestinian citizens to vote for the ruling Mapari party 
an ideological antithesis to of today's Western peace labor. So Mapai was in, in, in power, and um, it used the military government apparatus to coerce to intimidate the senior citizens into voting for the right and part. The military government employed a host of employed a host of water uh, suppression tactics, mainly the village mukhtar or heads of families were given ballots with a unique mark. And these and they handed these, these ballots to voters to cast. Now let's go into the before the elections, the military government would tour Arab villages, uh, spread the uh, Zionist propaganda for the Mapai party. And they would then uh, gather the heads of the families and give each a pack of signed or marked ba ballots, uh, most often signed in Arabic, with Arabic letters. <clears throat> and these ballots were, of course, ultimately cast for, for the Mapai party. Now, in other cases, uh, the voters were instructed to fold the ballots in a specific way. So that when the, when the, when, when the ballots are counted, the uh, military government or the governor's men could tell the Mapainiks from the commons, members of the uh, 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 Makai party. Let's say, now, family, families who showed the right ballots were, of course, um, rewarded with more local authority, privileges, uh, 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 travel permits. And those who failed to show the right ballots fell from grace and were punished with administrative detentions. Not surprisingly, Mapai won more than 50% of the Arab uh, votes in the elections held throughout the military government here. Meanwhile, other uh, Zionist parties, uh, unfair of that, uh, aware of that unfair advantage that Mapai had among Arab voters, uh, moved and courted Palestinians by claiming they should be treated as fully equal citizens. They also cast their ethnicity votes after uh, the 1950s against the continuation of the military rule. And one party that benefited from Palestinian votes was Renat Lubegin Sirud Morales, the political forebear of Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party, just died. So it was a cynical solidarity with Arab citizens, was on the part of Sirud. And we are against the military government, it was, you know, but of course it was all part of the propaganda. Now, but the Zionist party recognition of Arab uh, of Palestinian voting and participation meant mainly to boost the Zionist cause because by promoting their participation in the Israeli political process, Zionist politicians were hoping or managed to divert Palestinian national sentiments into demands for civil and political uh, 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 rights within Israel, political representation, and the dismantling of this community institution. The incorporation of the Palestinians meant that even during the times of extreme violence against Palestinians in Lebanon, Georgia, and the West Bank, those in Israel refrained from taking up arms against Israel or joining their co nationals against the Jewish state. And it worked. In fact, for decades, most Palestinians in Israel did not even identify as such, with many accepting the term Israeli Arabs. In fact, in 1948, there was an Arab party in the government, the Democratic List of Nazareth, uh, an Arab satellite list uh, formed by David Ben-Gurion of Mapai to mobilize Arab vote and counter the communists. Needless to, uh, to say, I mean, all the parties, except the Communist Party at that time, were formed or were actually created by uh, Mapai. Needless to say, they were puppet uh, parties. Why am I not moving this? I don't know. I need to be able to press and then, or, so. And that was actually the last time an Arab party sat in the Knesset. Um, oh, in the government, I'm sorry. Now, this pattern has persisted. In fact, for many years after the dismantling of the military government, and even today, Palestinians have been voting for Zionist parties uh, in the hope that they will make good on their promises. They were even willing to admit um, or accept um, some level of Jewish privilege, uh, mainly in the cultural realm, like say symbols, in exchange for more political and civil rights. 
uh, life under the military government, pretty much like the West Bank today, the military government in Israel involved ethnic segregation, and which included restricted uh, movement for Palestinians. Now, it would take an Arab citizen hours or maybe a day uh, to travel or to reach or to travel to get from one village to another or to the nearest city or town. Uh, the nearest thing I can think about is uh, a, a Palestinian in the West Bank trying to get into Israel. Uh, passing through security checkpoints uh, and military and military uh, travel permit application, etc. Now, <clears throat> economic segregation, which meant allocating far fewer resources uh, to the Arab sector for education, healthcare, public works, uh, economic development, etc. Land confiscation, about 40% of Arab land was confiscated by the state and uh, used for development projects that benefited Jewish uh, citizens mainly. Travel permits and fines, and now that was a complex uh, system. There were travel permits, work permits, daily permits, hourly permits, and uh, uh, actually a headline uh, in the daily, in the periodical Al-Ittihad, from May 1st, 1950, read, oh, that's the old one. Yeah, military rule and permits are the hallmark of ethnic discrimination against Arabs. Now, the writer was um, a member of the Arab Workers Association, and he, he was under the title A Day with the Military Government in Acre, Akka. And this writer recounts trying to reach from his small village in the north to get from, to travel from there to Nazareth by taking the bus to Acre first to issue a military government, a, a military a, a travel permit that would allow him to travel to Nazareth, but being detained in a, a, at a checkpoint near uh, Acre for a, ha for a whole day with hundreds of other Palestinians waiting for their permits, including children and women. And the funny thing, he never reached Nazareth, you know, at least not that day. So, um, yeah, that's the good one, but that's a good one, actually. Permit allocation and fines were uh, also pr a profitable business that provided the military government with a steady income. Uh, for Palestinians, securing a permit came at a heavy economic and moral cost because most often securing a, a permit involved spying on a fellow Palestinian in exchange for privileges and for travel permits. Okay. In other words, most of the people who had permits were spies. Uh, now... <laughs> Or they had to, you know, do some, you know, to collaborate with the military uh, government. That meant that the state was leveraging freedom and free movement as a privilege, not as a right. In this culture of surveillance, or actually self-surveillance, the military government system created a spying network among Palestinian citizens. As a result, Arab citizens were divided by state officials into good Arabs and bad Arabs. We know this story from... You know, Hillel Cohen's book, <clears throat> mainly. Now, in the cultural realm, the military government created a state of national cultural isolation among Palestinian citizens. Think about it. Access to Arabic newspapers were, was almost impossible. Arabic books and publications were scanned and available to a handful of educated Palestinians. Now, Fadwa Tukan, a Palestinian poet who lived in, in Nablus, recounts in her memoir her uh, encounters with Arabs or Palestinians from the Israeli side. Now, it's a long quote, but to sum it up in a nutshell, she likens, or for a Palestinian, what she says, for a Palestinian, a Palestinian had a better chance of finding a treasure than finding a book in Arabic at that time. Uh, oh, yeah, you have the quote. Yeah, all right. Moving on. Uh, the military government was also a period of unbridled collective punishment or violence against Palestinians. On October 29, 1956, during the Suez Crisis, the Israeli border police announced a sudden curfew on the Arab village of Kafar Qasim, and you know the rest of the story. The Kafar Qasim massacre unfolded and um, claimed the lives of 48 Palestinians, including residents from my own village, Kafar Bara. 
which was which is just north of Kfar Qasim. Uh, and of course, there was a sulha afterward, and <laughs> which means recon- a reconciliation ceremony. But in Arabic or Palestin- local Palestinian parlance, sulha means no account- lack of accountability or no accountability. So if we have a fight, oh, let's have a sulha, forget everything and move on. So, in, uh, and that's how Israeli um, officials swept the massacre under the rug of, uh, of Arab tradition. The crime went unpunished. And it's Hashadmi, the highest IDF officer tried for the massacre, admitted before his death that his trial was staged to protect military and political uh, elites. He was even photographed with a tin fruited coin, which was a symbolic fine uh, that he had to pay for the massacre. What I'm saying is it was the military government system that enabled and justified such violence against Palestinian citizens. Historian Adam Ratz and others believe that the Kufur Qasim massacre was part, a part of a broader plan to transfer Arab citizens uh, from Israel. Luckily, it didn't work out. But, I mean, in fact, my village, Kufur Bara, was next in line. But destiny intervened to spare it a similar fate. Uh, Nemrod Lambert, the Israeli commander who was dispatched to my village with similar orders, had a feeling of heart that day. He spoke, he said, I spoke with the Mukhtar that morning and my, my feelings changed I, and I decided not to carry out uh, the orders. Uh, Benjamin Cole, whose pl- pl- platoon was posted to the neighboring village of Jarjula. Now we're talking about the, it's called the Southern Triangle, which includes Kafar Qasim, Kafar Bara, my village, and Jarjula. So Cole in Jarjula also refused to allow soldiers to shoot. And he later confessed we had an explicit order to shoot everyone after five. All right. Now let's, okay, so a personal note. I mean, for me, it's shocking to me personally that I owe my existence, the fact that I'm standing before you today to a series of divine interventions and political whims. Soldiers refusing to carry orders, then my village survived, then the Nakba, my grandfather somehow was uh, in the field that day and uh, he escaped, you know, uh, 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 ethnic cleansing or or, or, uh, exile. It's just, it makes me feel how fragile my existence and other Palestinian existences are. Yeah, mm. resistance. Of course, there were, there were instances of resistance to the military government system, uh, including peaceful and nonviolent resistance, protests, administration, uh, demonstrations, strikes, subversive activity, which was limited in scope and was taken mainly by the uh, Al-Ard movement, the land movement, which was nationalist or pan-Arab nationalist movement. But it was limited in scope, as, as I said. Periodic spark of, sparks of civil disobedience also. However, on the other hand, there was a painful process of, a process of painful assimilation, clownish in places actually, which, such as celebrating Israel's independence and accepting Jewish privilege in return for civil rights and freedoms. Or Emil Habibi, for example, uh, in his book, uh, La Pes Optimist, depicts a flag flying among, uh, by Arab citizens as a tactic of survival. So is singing Hatikva, or, sh- or standing in sil- silence on a Israel's uh, Memorial Day. I sang Hatikva for years, coping with the awkward uh, uh, feeling that I actually love the song. <laughs> and I felt awkward about it, and, and then my father said, you should stop singing it, and I did. <laughs> so, uh, but I heard it on the radio every night. So, uh, and st- it's actually still running in my, in my head. The Naksa, the Naksa was, uh, the Naksa 1967 was ironically a liberating moment for Palestinian citizens in Israel. In June 1967, Israel defeated a coalition of Arab armies in a six-day war and annexed more Arab lands. The West Bank is with East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. Israel's Arab citizens were 
the only Arab party that emerged victorious from the defeat. For the first time since 1948, we had a chance to see the rest of Palestine, Jerusalem, a bit of Syria, a bit of Jordan, and a slice of Egypt. What's more, while the military administration officially ended or was abolished in December 1966, it was only after the war that Israel actually effectively lifted the uh, military government because it sought to transfer its uh, military forces to the West Bank and Gaza to administer the newly occupied territories. So their loss was our gain, which in the most, in the most cynical uh, sense. It was an awkward mo moment of liberation. People flocked to Jerusalem, across the Green Line, some for Arab, uh, uh, Arabic goods, some for pure Arab air. Uh, local newspapers feature images of old men and women weeping at the sight of Arabic books displayed in Jerusalem's, uh, uh, in the streets of Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem's old city. Some uh, went to the Golan Heights to catch a close uh, glimpse of Syria. Others camped on Egyptian soil across the Sinai Peninsula. Many, like my father and grandfather, went east, headed eastward to, to reunite with their Palestinian relatives across the border. In a better twist of irony, Palestinians on both sides of the border were united by defeat. End of the military government. Now, uh, the military government was officially abolished uh, in December 1966, though a uh, Israel state of emergency remained in place. It was a strain, an arcane uh, uh, law that Israel inherited, uh, inherited actually from the uh, mandate period. Uh, now, there's something here. <clears throat> Maybe later. Oh. But has the military government truly ended? For many Palestinian citizens, the military government never actually uh, ended because uh, many patterns persisted. Segregation patterns, dominance and surveillance mechanisms remained in place. No, no genuine attempts were made to integrate Arab citizens into the fabric of Israeli society. Discriminatory laws privileging Jewish citizens, including the so-called Jewish uh, nation state law, which most of you most likely heard about. So let's skip that. Uh, Adala, the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel, covers or counts over 60 basic laws that discriminate and disenfranchise against uh, Arab citizens. Together, they bear a striking resemblance to the Jim Crow South. Uh, now... Patterns of voter intimidation and suppression are also still in place, including uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, occasional uh, unending, or unending actually, fear-mongering against Arab voting. But in Arabs uh, to the era, to the voting uh, stations, etc., cetera, et cetera, which is ironic if you think about it. It stands in sharp contrast to David Ben-Gurion's encouraging Arab uh, voter, of course, to vote for Mapai. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, people also continue to, bo to vote with uh, marked ballots, including myself. I voted that way for many years. Uh, and there was a case, actually, a losing candidate in my village uh, went to court, and he claimed that uh, these uh, marked ballots were illegal. And the judge said, and he actually just uh, uh, placed a ban on marked ballots, but the other candidate claimed, we, 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 we inherited that from the military government period. It's not our, the Zionists uh, uh, invented this system. So uh, other patterns are in place, but I'm moving to lingering perceptions. Now, Arab disenfranchisement is also deeply entrenched in the political discourse and rhetoric uh, in Israel. Uh, Israeli officials continue to uh, portray Arab citizens as the enemies from within, uh, fifth column population, and uh, a demographic time bomb. And also uh, the so-called Lieberman plan, which I believe you heard about, which proposed transferring Arab citizens to the West Bank in exchange for uh, Jewish settlers. Uh, loyalty, Lieberman and also Netanyahu both proposed loyalty tests for Arab citizens, threatening to uh, um, strip Arabs of their citizenship, those who fail to be stripped of their uh, uh, Israeli citizenship, citing their 
lack of loyalty to the uh, state of Israel. Now, a question that has always haunted me as, as a historian and also as a Palestinian, how did the military government remain in place for almost 20 years, which is quite a long time for a military government or an emergency uh, state? Or, and my theory is the military government left gaps of freedoms and gaps of freedoms and privileges to be exploited. The ability to maneuver, the idea that you could evade the checkpoint or vote or play hide and seek with uh, soldiers at the checkpoint or spy on a fellow citizen ex in exchange for a permit or bribe a military official for certain privileges or raise the Israeli flag to show your unquestioning uh, loyalty. These little maneuvers or tactics uh, of survival made the system durable. In other words, it was the very fragility and vulnerability of the military government system that helped sustain it and prolong, prolong it. Uh, now, the military government, in other words, was not a totalitarian system. It did not seek to crush its victims into total defeat or announce a total victory over its subjects. It was a form of governments that sought to rule an unwanted minority through a blend of dominance and hegemony. Now, hegemony means uh, the practice uh, of state power that rests mainly on um, um, manufacturing consent and legitimacy al among the local population, uh, while dominance uh, basically relies primarily on force and coercion. So, if I were a Palestinian in 1948 who survived ethnic cleansing and transferred, I would look at the military government as a sort of upgrade. So, and that kind of feeling mostly helped the system stay for, as I said, two, almost two decades. Uh, Palestinians were still shocked from the Nakba, and they were, what they see around was basically, what they saw around was basically refugees, living in tents, right? um, extreme violence, Lebanon, Jordan. So, that's kind of durability that uh, is what actually uh, enabled the system to stay for quite longer than it should have. Uh, okay, and now, uh, a decade after the abolition of the military government, uh, legacy would continue to hunt Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian population in Israel, uh, sparking repeated uh, instances of arrest and resistance, especially on the issue of land confiscation. A major event took place on March 30th, uh, 1976, when Palestinians in Israel staged a general strike to protest the continuing confiscation of their land by Israel. In response, Israel, Israeli military forces killed six Palestinians that day, and the event came to be known as Land Day, which Palestinians commemorate as a national day uh, every year. Uh, unrecognized victims. Uh, let's talk about the Bedouin. Uh, nearly half of... Uh, the Arab Bedouin in, uh, in the Naqab region in the south in Israel uh, still live in so-called uh, unrecognized villages, unrecognized villages. These are citizens, but they live in unrecognized villages. Some of these villages, like Al-Araqib, were raised over 200 times by Israel. Uh, Bedouin in the Negev uh, face the daily threat of forceful eviction and uh, trans ethnic transfer. Today, there are 40 unrecognized villages Bedouin villages in Israel, most of which existed actually before the founding of the state. Now, I tried to trace down that uh, history in my book on the Bedouin, where, where I also describe the Bedouin as uh, stateless citizens. Now, remember the military government. Where's the memorial, Kafar Qasim Memorial? Now, this, I have a picture of the Kafar Qasim Memorial, which a... a which is located at the entrance of the village and serves as a constant reminder of the violent legacy of the military government. I remember during, because the massacre took place in October, so every year, October is also the olive picking season in, in Palestine. Every year when we picked olive, we picked olive and we traded stories of survival and, you know, uh, stories of the massacre. So you, we heard this, these stories every day, especially from survivors, including from my village or Kofor Qasim. Um, <clears throat> now, in education, 
Uh, the Zionist narrative continues to be taught in Arabic schools, where the military government period is passed on in silence in history book, etc. Uh, psychology. Now, of course, memory suppression and forgetting our eraser is also a uh, 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 rampant amount uh, Palestinians themselves, including my father. Uh, actually, Arab, I, I like to describe Arab citizens in Israel as a traumatized minority. Now, my father, his first advice to me when I left home for the Hebrew University in Jerusalem was, keep politics under your head. He always, and he still, he acts as if the military government had never existed. Oh, okay, we had, you had this slide? Okay. Or right, that's, that's from the Atlantic. I actually, I called my father an Akba denier. And who can blame him? He was in a state of denial because he wanted to protect me. And he was just grateful that we, we, we survived and remained in Israel while m many of our uh, Palestinian uh, brothers and sisters, you know, could not. So, um, yeah. The military government in literature, that's my favorite topic. How much, how much time do I have? Yeah. Huh? Okay, that's all. Okay. The military government period is, <clears throat> oh, I skipped a lot here, uh, is commemorated uh, in the Arabic literature written by um, Palestinians in Israel. A uh, key figure uh, of this literary movement was Emil Shukri Habibi, who was born in Haifa in 1922 and died in Haifa in 1996. Habibi was a founding member of the um, Communist Party in Israel. He was elected to the Knesset three times. He was also editor-in-chief of Al-Ittihad, where he published numerous articles and editorials on political and cultural issues. He belongs to a generation of, Palestinian, of Palestinians who grew up in the shadow of the military government. The bulk of his literary works are set in that period, and where he also uh, spent his formative years and wrote his early works. He wrote in Arabic and Hebrew, for me, he, he, he is or he was the quintessential Palestinian writer, uh, Israeli Arab writer or Palestinian Israeli writer. Uh, the Pesa Optimist was his masterpiece, a tragic comedy. It was printed three times and received wide, uh, spread, uh, wide acclaim, both in Israel and in the Arab world. The novel was published in 19, as you can see, uh, 74. That is 30 years after the Nakba and a decade after the abolition of the military government. Now, it was, it is the temporal distance from the past that actually allowed Habibi to approach it with a fresh, reverent, and human uh, perspective. He was somehow, he was the kind of artist who was writing after, you know, a redeemed artist that is no longer traumatized or paralyzed by the past. Um, the book tells the story of those Palestinians who managed to remain in Israel and who overnight became strangers in their homeland. Uh, it reflects a unique and localized Palestinian uh, uh, experience that was largely overshadowed by the grand narratives of the Nakba. Uh, instead of the dark and somber and romanticized um, uh, uh, tone of his contemporaries, Habibi approaches the Palestinian tragedy with a rare sense of mockery and paradox, sarcasm, etc., Actually, it was, he was the first Palestinian writer to laugh about the Nakba, or even to make jokes about the Nakba, which was barbaric at the time to think about. Well, right? It's just, who said no poetry after the Holocaust? No poetry after Auschwitz, Adorno. Uh, after, yeah, yeah, Adorno. So, no jokes about the Nakba, but Emil Habibi was kind of, you know, he was the guy who you expect to break all taboos, uh, which he did so brilliantly in the uh, Peace Optimist. Now, if you compare, for example, Habibi's Pes Optimist with Ghassan Kanafani's Men in the Sun, another Palestinian classic. Kanafani's novel is about the experience of exile, those who fled their homes and perished on the road. It's about displacement and loss. Also, Kanafani's other novel, Returning to Haifa, is hunted by the theme of exile and loss. Habibi's novel tells the story of a lost Palestinian generation who grew up under the yoke of military government. It is about survival in the homeland steadfastness, or so more than Arabic, but also, also assimilation and collaboration. Um, the heroes of Kanafani's novel perished in the desert in a tragic ending. Habib's hero, or anti-hero, dies too, but he dies a fantastical death. 
He goes upwards to heaven. He transcends reality. He's supernatural. There is no total loss here. In fact, we can even glimpse a glimmer of hope in the novel. Hence the best optimist. The hero, Saeed, an Akba survivor who sells his soul to the military government, was at once lucky and miserable. He was lucky to survive, but miserable to survive that way. Uh, his subversive movement in time and place within the new state of Israel and under the military government allows him to expose the shocking absurdities of the new Palestinian reality after the Nakba. One minute. One minute. Two, three. Uh, the, okay, let's mesh. And he was, speaking of aliens, he was abducted, ultimately saved by aliens. Uh, I, I have a, a quote here about being saved by aliens. Uh, quote, my whole life has been strange, and a strange life can only end strangely. When I asked my extraterrestrial friend why he took me in, he merely replied, what alternative did you have? Um, yeah. No, that's it. Okay, sorry, that's it. All right, uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Okay, now we have um, um, like uh, ten to fifteen minutes for questions. Um, it's open for you to ask any questions. Yeah, go ahead. So I, have, I have two questions. You really briefly mentioned that. So you mentioned that it was during the British mandate period that British colonial laws were what provided the legal impetus for Israel to enact the military administration. Can you explain what British laws were enacted and how Israel just continued those laws? I'm, I'm curious about that. The emergency, state of emergency law that was put in place by the British uh, uh, just before the war. Uh, but Israel improved on it, of course. Mm. So the military government or the, was a purely Israeli invention. Mm -hmm. uh, the state of emergency law was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was set in, uh, put in place during the mandate. And it continued all the way to, as I said, 1967. So that's why I say that was a moment of liberation for mm -hmm. Palestinians inside Israel. Yeah. My, my second question mm -hmm. pertains to the different policies of the military administration based on the region. So you mentioned in the Triangle, we saw the Kafir Qasim massacre in the south. I assume it was much stricter from Kafir Qasim all the way to Um al Fahm. Um, is that correct, or was there a uniform policy throughout? The Northern Triangle, yeah. I mean, that, that's a good question, because uh, you need to ask a really a good historian about that. If there were plans also to extend it all the way to the Northern Triangle, Wadi Ara, mm. Um al Fahm. What I can tell you that Wadi Ara, which is... Uh, uh, predominantly populated by uh, uh, Arab citizens, 100%. was uh, repeatedly uh, proposed as, as, as a new border mm. of Israel as part of the transfer plan. Yeah. So if we can move, all, you know, Wadi Ara would be the new green line. Yeah. So it's transferring Arabs from Wadi Ara or the uh, Muthalat al-Shamali is always still there. Mm. I mean, the ideas are floating and are being floated, you know, mm -hmm. occasionally. Part, part of the reason is also to intimidate the Arab 100%. minority into kind of accepting this Jewish supremacy or, you know, or Zionist supremacy in, in Israel. And um, so every time an Arab sounds some nationalist sentiment or Palestinian sentiment, mm. you have some Zionist official coming up with this kind of proposal. But they're not empty rhetoric. I mean, there were plans in, in place. But right now, I don't think... Right now, what we, uh, what we, what we are seeing in, in the West Bank, that um, these plans are becoming out of date mm. because there is an apartheid in system, in, uh, system in place and the settler community uh, spiraling out of control. So, uh, I mean, Wadi Ara is not enough yeah. <laughs> anymore, right? right? Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I um, I ha so I have a kind of a comment that leads into a question. Um, so during the talk, you maybe inadvertently or maybe intentionally drew some, made some sort of points that um, suggested a, a kind of interesting parallel between Palestinian citizens of Israel 
and their situation and the way that they sort of contend with their situation um, and Jews in the diaspora. I mean, you mentioned Auschwitz in relation mm. to the Nakba, right? No poetry after Auschwitz. Um, you called your father a Nakba denier, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a, a, a sort of an interesting point of intersection there. Um, and also the way you described Habibi's writing um, as this kind of sarcastic and sometimes self-deprecating, um, uh, the humor that, that, that you, I think, mm-hmm. obviously correctly read in him um, is something that I think is really um, a characteristic of much diasporic Jewish writing as well mm-hmm. and Jewish comedy. Um, and I wondered, because you drew a comparison between Habibi and Kanafani, um, both really towering literary figures, but very different yeah, yeah. Uh, figures as well. And I wonder if maybe you can elaborate a little bit, because you kind of gestured toward the difference between them, or a difference between them. And I wonder if maybe you can expand a little bit on the difference between a writer who is a citizen of Israel, and now we have sort of several generations of writers, whether they write in Hebrew or in Arabic, and a writer who is a Palestinian, full stop. That's a good question. Now, there is in, uh, let's start with this. There is in Emil Habibi a tacit acceptance of Israel, a recognition of the new Palestinian reality. He was a Knesset member for three terms. He was, as I say, quintessential Israeli Arab citizen who wrote in Hebrew and Arabic, and he wrote about Arabs in Israel. Habib was willing to accept the new reality of Israel. Kenafani was a militant, refugee in exile in Beirut, who was not willing to accept Israel. And also the way they view the other, the Israeli other. Habibi was more, Habibi's other was, if you say, uh, uh, his view of the other was uh, less exotic, or I say, than uh, Kenafani. Kenafani never had an, an encounter, a real life encounter with an Israeli. For him, everything he knew about Israelis, he heard from his parents, grandparents. Uh, so, Habibi is, so Habibi is the assimilative, but he's not assimilating the term. He's not, he was not willing to surrender to the notion that Israel was a Jewish state and the Arabs were there strangers and guests. Uh, for Kenafani, it was, uh, as I say, <coughs> basically the idea of, for example, if you read uh, Men in the Sun, there is no mention of the Israeli other in the whole novel. Return to Haifa. In, exactly. Now I'm coming to that. Of Holocaust survivors in, who have come to, to in returning to Haifa is actually is the opposite. It's obsessed yes. with the Israeli. It is about the Israeli. But very other. empathetic. In but some very, respects. But if you compare it to Habibi, you can see that Kenafani was kind of what I say romantic, or he was an outsider. If you think about it that way. Uh, so of course, I, I think the comparison might be. Uh, the comparison, basically what I wanted to say, Habibi was genius in shifting the focus from this romanticized notion of Palestine, the Palestinian tragedy, to more supernatural, fantastical elements. And if you think about it, actually, the, I think the alien metaphor was the most humanizing aspect in the whole novel. Uh, and also the idea of laughter. Speaking of laughter, and Habibi likens the military government system or Arabs in Israel uh, to an open air prison. It's a Kafka sick, you know, uh, city where Arabs woke up one morning and found themselves in prison by the state of Israel. And, but these prisoners were allowed to go mad from time to time and uh, burst into a spasm of historical laughter, hysterical laughter. And that was embedded in his philosophy of laughter. He, he has a quote, laughter is a very sharp weapon with only one edge. If all the prisoners laugh together at the same time, will the jailer then be able to laugh? So it was a hysterical laugh in the face of despair. And uh, now it's Holocaust. Now, this is an irony. Uh, here's an irony. I grew up in Israel as a uh, Palestinian. You know, uh, I went to Israeli schools. For, let's say, for 20 years, I learned everything about the Holocaust. 
Yom HaZikaron, Jewish memorials, the Israeli. Not a word about the Nakba. The first time I heard about the Nakba was when I went to Hebrew University and from a Jewish friend. <laughs> no, I, I write about that in the Atlantic. And they, you know, so uh, for me, uh, I, and I stood in silence and, you know, remember that we all stood in silence. Remember at school, they lined us up, the Karon, the siren, everything. But we never heard of the Nakba or, or the military government. My father was not willing to talk about it. My grandmother, my grandfather, nobody was willing to talk about it. People were in a state of, you know, were still traumatized probably. But we heard a good deal about the Holocaust. And Holocaust, I, I could say, as an Arab in Israel, a Palestinian in Israel, Holocaust is part of my upbringing. Because it was embedded in the education system, in, in, in the rituals, state rituals, you know, the daily life. Yeah. So, uh, and so before Habibi, okay, no, no poetry after Auschwitz. Before Habibi, there was no jokes about them. Uh, and he, but you read his novel, it's hilarious, you know, how he was saved by the donkey. It's amazing that every time the uh, protagonist is saved, it's either by a donkey or aliens, but never God. I think it, perhaps at this point, I mean, when you, when you lose your homeland overnight and you see your people expelled and, you know, living in exile, you, you kind of start losing faith in God. Uh, and especially for a secular like Emil Habibi, you know, it was a purely secular novel, as art should be, I think. Uh, I took, I mean, my, my life as an alien was inspired by Emil Habibi. I see myself as an alien. I think a Palestinian born today knows nothing, absolutely nothing about the homeland or the, that his father grew, grew uh, up in. Everything for him is it's just, you know, uh, border ruin, uh, ruins and, 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 and the, the homeland of my father is like a foreign country to me. So that's, that's one aspect of being an alien. Uh, of course, okay, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned that the military occupation of Palestine within the 1967 borders ended at the Naqsa when they exported all of the military out to occupy the new territories. What part of the current occupation is drawn from the 1948 to 1967 occupation of Palestinians within Israel? What part is drawn? What, 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 what do you um, mean? What are the similarities between the current occupation? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, yeah. Because every time I mention the military government, the first thing people think of, oh, yeah, sure, the West Bank. And every time I had to explain that, no, I, I'm talking about a specific period in the history of Israeli or Palestinians in Israel who actually lived under a state of, it was, they call it internal occupation, or there's a Palestinian historian calls it internal colonialism, or call it whatever you want, but it's pretty much similar, I mean, Checkpoints, travel permits, uh, 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 surveillance. Some differences, of course. You could vote. That's something. But as long as you voted for Mapai, you were fine. So uh, it was pretty much, I mean, I think Israel exported its system or just simply moved it to the, to the West Bank. They had the experience, 20 years. And uh, what, what's, what's happening now is, is something else that I can't even, I can't explain any longer in terms of occupation. You call it apartheid, you call it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's got, from there and now the similarities kind of are starting, right now are starting to vanish if you think about it, the CETA community, et cetera. Et cetera. So, yeah, question? Yeah, okay. um, um, last question. Um, was there a distinction in the military government's treatment of different Palestinians based on uh, racial line, I mean, not racial, uh, religious lines? Like, was the treatment of like Muslim Palestinians different than Christian Palestinians, or was it just kind of this blanket Palestinian internal threat um, for all Palestinians regardless of their religious affiliation? If, you've, if, you th if, if you mean Israel was more terrible toward, uh, or tolerant, sorry, toward Christians, most of the communist, 
Communist Party members were communists, including Emil Habibi, and uh, were Christians, sorry, including Emil Habibi. And, well, the Druze, the Druze story is different, and the Bedouin story is a bit different. Some Bedouin were actually recruited in the, in the army. The Druze story, you know, uh, some Druze, you know, uh, families were also served in the army and became more integrated in the Israeli system. But there was no religious differentiation. Uh, it, it was purely ethnic. And uh, yeah, Christians were not treated anywhere any better than uh, Muslims. Uh, in fact, they were targeted. Most of them, because most of the intellectuals in the city were Christians, they were targeted uh, pretty harshly uh, by the state of Israel. Uh, Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm just going to move forward so maybe you can hear me a little bit. I don't want to like scream from across the room. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I am a, a student here at UT. Mm. I'm half Algerian, half Palestinian. Um, I grew up in Algeria, and uh, we, we share a similar history. Well, we, we share the same history. I'm half Palestinian. I mean, on the Algerian side, we share a similar history um, with the French occupation of Algeria. Um, and I grew up in Algeria as uh, an Algerian, but my family moved to France. Um, we have a phenomenon similar to Israeli Palestinians, uh, French Algerians. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We call them le, le pied noir. Pied noir yeah. And... Uh, their outlook on uh, France or French society is very different than how Algerians living in Algeria view France. Um, so also as a Palestinian, I feel like Palestinians who live outside of the region, Israel or Palestine, view the politics and the societies very differently than someone like yourself who grew up in Israel as a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. So, for me as a Palestinian, it uh, it's always hard to hear about the the, the different outlook that uh, Palestinian Israelis have on a lot of topics or a lot of you know issues, politics surrounding the state of Israel. And so I was wondering, how do you feel that your stances differ on you know Palestinians who live in the diaspora in the U.S. or in Palestine or anywhere in the world? Well, my, I mean, as an intellectual, I can always identify with Palestinians or as a, uh, everywhere as one. The, the, the genius of Ibn Habibi, he, he kind of managed to create this shared experience of Palestinians inside Israel as a unique experience that is different, but doesn't mean that he was willing to accept the division of West Bankers and Gazans and refugees and Israeli Palestinians, which, which the whole Zionist project was actually, uh, 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 it was part of what the state of Israel was uh, aiming for, to create this kind of divided Palestinian con uh, 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 or, uh, community with those in Israel are, as I said, they are somehow uh, hunted by, you know, demands of uh, assimilation and integration while the refugees are dreaming of uh, returning. But no one is somehow identifying uh, uh, or they do not necessarily identify as one people or one nation uh, with a shared destiny or shared history or a shared tragedy. That's why the Nakba was suppressed for so And still, there's a Nakba law in Israel. That actually bans the Nakba, right? The idea of banning the Nakba, because the Nakba is, I don't want to compare it to the Holocaust, I, wanna, I don't want to get there, but it's a shared memory or a shared tragedy for all Palestinians. If you are a refugee, you were expelled during the Nakba. If you are a Palestinian citizen of Israel, you remain despite the Nakba. If you are in Gaza, West Bank, of course, Jordan. So the Nakba was this binding uh, event for many Palestinians. And that's why you see there is this Nakba memory erasure targeting the Nakba. But we have other common <laughs> causes that, you know, 
Yeah, go ahead. Let's. Yep. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. All right.